Greetings programs. This is Tron FAQ again. And I'm back now with the next part of the tutorial where I'm going to focus on creating light cycle and DRES maps. Before I continue, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. First of all, in the last part of the tutorial, I told you about the Tron Tools Setup version 1.3 batch file, which will work if you've installed your Tron 2.0 game to the default directory, the default install location. But if you've installed to a custom location, the batch file will not work. So what you, you'll need to do is edit the batch file to reflect the custom directory where you've installed the game. I have instructions on how to edit the batch file in my FAQ, so please check them out and edit the batch file if you need to, if you've installed the game somewhere else other than the default location. Okay, now with that out of the way, let's continue. One of the first things I want to mention is that if you want, you can go to Edit, Options, and then to the Autosave tab and enable Autosave. Th what this will do is it'll save your, <coughs> your map automatically at the specified time interval here. It, it'll you can change the the time. It's the default is five minutes. The only thing is though is you have to make sure that the folder where the map will be saved to, the backup, exists on your hard drive. So for example here I've got D Tron 2.0 Game Worlds D Edit Backup. Make sure that this file is there, that there's a, a D Edit Backup file inside Worlds, or you can put it wherever you want, inside Tron 2.0 uh, slash tools, whatever you want. Otherwise, dedit will pop up an error message saying that the map cannot be backed up. It can't do an autosave because the folder doesn't exist. In my case, I don't use the autosave because if you're working on a map and you make a mistake, it's going to be saved in, in the backup anyways. So basically there's not much point to it if you ask me to use the autosave. The only reason for really using it is if you're working on your map and suddenly it crashes, the edit crashes, and somehow your map file becomes messed up that you were working on. At least then you have a backup. So for that reason it might be good to have a backup. But in my case what I do is I just save periodically every so often after I've made you know a few major changes to the map. I'll save it under a different name so that way I've got, you know, map number one or test one, test two, test three, and so on. So every time I make a fair number of changes to the map, I'll save it under a new name. And that way as I progress, I have earlier versions to fall back on if I find out as I progress through making the map that there's something I've done that really didn't work out well or there's something badly wrong. I can always then <coughs> load an earlier version and go back and start over again. Okay, now with that out of the way, I'm going to start working on a map. Right now we're looking at the camera viewport here that's on the top left and there are three other viewports that you use. The uh, top view which represents the X and Z axes. You've got the left view that represents the Y and Z axes and you've got the front view which represents the X and Y axes. So these three viewports show different points of view of your map. And then the top left one here is the camera view. And what you can do here is you can use this view to move around your map to look at different parts of it which I'll show you how to do shortly. Probably one of the first things you should do when you create a map is to create a floor for you to walk or drive around on. So what I'm going to do is, is now normally you would probably want to use a box because it's easier to create and work with. A box is also a type of brush. That's usually what they call simple ge geometrical shapes in, in map editing. They call them brushes. But I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to use a plane instead. And a plane is a type of brush that isn't a box or a rectangular shape with several sides. 
it's just a one-sided geometrical shape, a square. It only has one side to it. The reason I'm using a plane is because you don't need the other sides usually when you're making a floor. You just want a surface to stand on, so why not just use a plane which is a, a one-sided object and you don't need all those other sides. So that's what I'm going to use. So you right click, go to the add menu and then choose plane. And for the dimensions of the plane, I could change them and make them bigger. You'd want them to be quite large in order for your character or light cycle to move around on. But I'm just going to leave it the way it is for now and resize it later. The most important thing when creating this plane now is that I'm going to make sure that plus Y is selected so that when I click on OK, the plane will be facing upwards. The, the side of the plane will be facing upwards, so there's a surface to stand on. So now I'll click OK, and there it is. So right now this plane is far too small for you to move around on, so I'm going to need to make it bigger. So one of the first things I'll do now is I've moved over to the top view, and I'm going to change the grid size. And you change the grid size by using the plus and minus keys on your number pad on the keyboard. So I'm going to increase the grid size to, say, 1024, for example. Make the grid squares nice and big. Now what I'm going to do is hold down the O key on the keyboard. And now I'm going to use my mouse. I'm going to move it up and down. As you can see, as I move the mouse up and down, the grid is being zoomed out and in on. So I'm going to zoom out again now. Next, I'm going to resize the plane by zooming in enough so that I can see these black squares on the brush that are handles that allow you to either move or resize the brush. The square in the middle lets you move it around and the squares on the outside allow you to stretch or change the size of the brush. So now I'm going to grab one of them and drag it out to the nearest grid line. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit now so you can see that the, br the brush has been stretched out to the nearest grid line. So now I'm going to do the other side and this side this side. So now if I zoom out a bit and then also in the camera view now if I hold down the O key and move the mouse it changes the angle at which I'm looking at the map. And I can look around. And then if I hold down the I key it allows me to move. If you hold down the I key while moving the mouse up and down and side to side you can move around in the X plane and if you hold down the right, right mouse button at the same time as the I key and move the mouse around, you can move up and down in the Y plane. So now, as we can see, I've made the brush bigger by dragging the handles. But it's not really big enough, so let's make it a bit bigger. I'm going to zoom out some more and keep dragging the handles out further. So now the plane or the brush is quite large so now there's enough room for you to move around on as a player or character or a light cycle. So now what I'm going to do is texture the floor. I'm going to apply a texture to it so that it looks better because right now there's no texture on it. So what I'll do is, first of all, I have to make sure that the brush edit mode is selected. There are these icons here on the top, as you can see. This one, when I put the mouse pointer over it, it shows a tooltip that says brush edit. If I move over to the next one, there's another mode called geometry edit. And if I move over again one more, there's another one called object edit. And for now, we're in brush edit, and that's fine. So now I'll move over to the left here and click on this Textures tab here in the, the left pane. And then here are all the folders that contain textures. And the majority of them, the ones you usually want, are in the text folder here. So I'll click on this plus to the left of the text folder. 
it'll show all the subfolders within the text folder. And a lot of the textures are in prototype. There are some in the others as well, but most of them are in prototype, so I'm going to click the plus beside prototype. Now, if you look at the folders within prototype, as you can see, when Monolith created the game, they were obviously in a rush because uh, if you look at the names of the folders, they don't all make a lot of sense. They're not sensibly named. I mean, like we've got one here called Old Prototype, so that obviously points out or indicates to you that these are old, old textures that they started out with when they were first working on a prototype of the game. And then we got another one here called Test. And then if you go inside, let's say, M01, which stands for Mission 01, if you go inside, you'll see folders called Bill and Courtney and Curtis and so on. These are obviously the uh, texture artists who created the textures for the game, and they didn't bother renaming the, f the folders, so now we know who created the textures for the game, or at least the, the artists' first names anyways. And then if you go inside those folders by clicking the plus beside each one, you'll see other folders that, well, somewhat reflect what the textures were used for. For example, base here, it means that the textures in it were used for applying to base objects like the floor or the wall. Not always, but usually that's what they were used for. And then this one here is ceilings and lights and so on. So they sort of make sense, but not always. You'll find that as you navigate through these texture folders, sometimes the folder names make sense, sometimes they don't. Basically, you're just going to have to go in and look at each one and, and try and find something that you think looks good. It's actually kind of a pain. There are thousands of them, so it can be a little frustrating to find the right texture sometimes to uh, apply to the surfaces of your brushes. It can be hard to find the right one sometimes that just looks the way you want it to. There is something you can do to help out a little bit. If you click on a folder and then go up here into the menu, the view menu here, and then click on texture palette, it'll pop up a window that shows the textures in this folder with a bit more detail. You can see them better. So this way it helps to find a texture within that folder that you might want to use. Okay, let's get out of this. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to choose just a simple basic texture to apply to my floor. So I'm going to go into this old prototype folder and scroll down. Actually, I think instead what I'll do is I'll go into this one here, Global Data Blocks New. Yeah, I'll choose a texture in here. There's some nice square textures that I can use to create a grid-like pattern on the floor. So I'll scroll down now and I'll, I'll pick uh, the red one here. It's a red square. And I'll move back to the camera viewport here. Right click, go to the texture menu, and then choose Apply Texture. But before I do that though, just make sure that the brush is highlighted that either by clicking on it here in the viewport or if you click on the nodes tab here on the left it'll show you all the objects in your map, the brushes, the objects, everything and make sure that there's a red check mark here in the left square beside the name of the brush or object so the left square here has a red check mark in it, that means that that brush is selected so now I can go back over here Texture, Apply Texture, and now we have the texture on our floor. The only problem is, is it's not the right size. If you look at it, it's way too big. It's been stretched out to cover the entire floor, which is no good. So what we'll do is we'll right-click, go to Texture, and then choose Map Texture Coordinates. And then what we do is change the scale. Right now it's way too big. It's a ridiculously large number. So I'll shrink it down to, say, 64 by 64. 
and then click OK. And now as we can see, the texture looks much better. Now it's been shrunk down and you have all these grid squares on the floor, which is exactly what we want. So with that done, the next thing I'm going to do is add an object. So I'm going to, first of all, move to the middle of the floor. And as you can see, there are these green lines that are a marker. They're called a marker in D-Edit. And you can move this marker around by moving to one of the viewports, pointing your cursor at one of the grid intersections where the lines meet on the grid, and hit X, and the marker will move there. So let me just put it back in the middle again. You can do the same thing in this viewport. I'll move it up by moving to a grid intersection and hitting the X key. I'm moving the marker up. I'll move it back to the middle, and so on. So right now, the marker is on the very middle, the center of the floor, which is good for now. Because what I'm going to do is I'll add an object. And something I think a lot of Tron map, map makers don't do, but should, is add a world properties object. Every map should really have a world properties object. So make it a habit to put it in there, one of the first things that you put in. So now I'll click OK. And now there's a world properties object, this square-like shape here, right in the middle on, in the floor. What I'll do is I'll move to the left viewport here. And I'm just going to use the up arrow key to move the world properties object up. Since I created the world properties object, it's been automatically selected here in the nodes pane. It's checked off, so I didn't need to do it. So once it's been checked off, then if you move into any of the viewports and use the arrow keys, you can move the object around and it'll s snap to the grid. It'll jump to the grid line as you move it to each grid line. Now I'm going to adjust the properties of the world properties object. So I'm to click I'm going to click on the Properties tab here and take a look at what's inside. One of the first things you want to change is the far Z. What that is is that this field in the World Properties object defines how far you can see into the distance on your map. So for example, right now it's set to 100,000 de-edit units. And that's a really large number. That's huge. Most maps are nowhere near that big. So you should lower this number to a much more reasonable amount. And usually what I put it at is at 30,000. That's a more reasonable number. That's typically what you, your largest map will be. Most are smaller. So if you want, you can try lowering this number even more. But the problem is if you set it too low, then parts of your map will start to disappear as you move through it as you move, suddenly you'll see part of your map just vanish. So if you set this number too low, that's what will happen. The idea is that you want to set this as low as possible so that it just encompasses your map. So that as you move to any point of the map, you can still see it. Otherwise, if you set it too high, like it was before, what will happen is just the game engine will try to draw whatever is far away in the distance. Even though there's nothing there, it'll still keep trying to draw what's there anyways. And it slows your map down. So lowering this number tells the engine, tells the game, that there's less to worry about in the distance. So don't even bother trying to draw it. And that will help to speed up your map. Make sure that you leave clamp far Z here set to true, because that is what tells the game to use this number, to use the far Z number. If you set it to false, it'll stop using the number and just it'll draw everything that that's there. It'll draw it'll try drawing at an infinite distance, so you don't want that. The other thing that you want to change in the world properties object or that you might want to change is the music control file. This allows you to add music to your map. If you want to use the, the music that came with the Tron game, this is how you do it. You click on this B here to browse. And then you move to 
the music folder and then here you'll find all the different missions that are in the game with their fold with folders named after them so as you can see you've got ancient and then you've got one called Bradley and cinematics and city and so on so basically it's up to you you can pick whichever music you you think would fit best with your map the folder descriptions are generally descriptive enough so you can guess what type of music is inside them but unfortunately you can't listen to them beforehand so you'll just have to go in there and try each one and see what you like I'm going to go inside to the of the realm folder here and then you need to look for a text file inside and here it is here's one called realm text so you click on that and now this text file is a music control file and it tells the game how to play the music in your map and below this you'll see something called min music mood minimum music mood what that is is that you can change the intensity of the music in your map to start with the default like for example right now it's set to routine so that means that when the music plays in your map it's going to play at the default level which is like a peaceful type of music where you're just exploring and looking around there's nothing special happening but you can change that you can increase the level the intensity to a higher level so that when the music starts in your map it's a more intense type of music by default okay the next thing you'll want to do now is add a start point to your map a start point is where the character or a light cycle will appear on the map now actually you really need more than one you'll need eight for light cycles and up to 16 for a D-Res or Team D-Res map because if you only put one start point on the map everyone who joins the, the game will appear at that one point and you don't want that so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make a light cycle, light cycle map I'm only going to add one start point just for the purpose of this example but really you should add eight start points at different locations on the map so you'll add one move it where you want then add another one move it somewhere else and so on so you'll want eight of them for a light cycle map spaced out enough so that the players don't spawn near each other and, and don't crash into each other so I'm going to right click choose add object and the type of start point that you want for a light cycle map is game start point so I'll click OK and now we have the game start point here in the middle and I'll move down into this view and move the game start point up now you should move the game start point up let's say 128 units at least from the floor so that way it's not in the floor otherwise if you leave the start point in the floor the player will spawn in the floor and that's not good you don't want that so I'm going to move to the top view here now and zoom out way out and I'm just going to drag the game point way over here somewhere toward the edge near the edge okay now if you zoom in enough you'll see this blue line here on the start point that blue line shows which way the player will be facing when they spawn in so right now my game start point is facing toward the side of the floor and I don't want that I want it to, f to face inward toward the center of the floor so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over here to the left and click here on this button beside rotation and I'll use the yaw slider and as you see as I drag the yaw slider it rotates the object and I want the blue line 
to be facing toward the center. So I put it at 270 degrees, which is now making the blue line face the center. Now I'll click OK. And there we go. Now the player, when he spawns in, will be facing the center of the map. Now over here, you'll see these options here called Game Type Model Template and Physics Model here. And you you can change the game type, for example, to multiplayer light cycle and change the physics model here to light cycle if you want. But I found through testing that you don't even need to change these things. The game will actually ignore these settings. Just as long as you put a game start point in your light cycle map, the player will spawn as the light cycle player and you'll be able to drive around on the map. You don't even need to change these. But just to be safe, go ahead and change the game type to multiplayer light cycle since you're making a multiplayer light cycle map. And for the physics model, change it to light cycle. Now the documentation, the Tron Tools document, documentation tells you that you should add a trigger object to your map called MP Start and another trigger object called Land Clean. MP start is supposed to execute commands when the map starts up and land clean is supposed to execute commands when the map ends. But to be honest, you don't even need these triggers really. It, it might be a good idea to put them in if you're doing some fancy things on your light cycle map, having things occur like events and things changing in your map. But if you're just creating a simple light cycle map, you don't even need the MP start and land clean trigger objects. And in fact, they don't even have to be called MP start or land clean. It, it's not necessary. So it's up to you if you want to use them or not. I'm not going to bother because this is just a really simple example. So I'll just leave them out. If you do decide to use MP start to to trigger commands that do things in your map, one what you would do is go to the viewport over here, right click, go to add object, scroll down until you find trigger, click on trigger, click OK, and now you'll have a trigger object added to your map. And if you were using this trigger object, you'd go here to this commands option and click the button and it pops up a, a window that allows you to type in a whole bunch of commands. But, as I said, we're not going to bother using the MP start trigger in this map because it's just a simple example. So I'll just get out of here and I'll go to the nodes tab. And one thing you'll want to make sure of what you want to do is if you do use this trigger, is you want to rename it. So either you click on the name and then click on it again or you right click on the name and choose rename and then rename it to MP start and make sure that when you give objects names that you don't use spaces that's bad if you add spaces it will cause you problems make sure it's one continuous string of characters you can use underscores in the place of spaces if you want but just make sure that it's one continuous word without any odd characters like spaces for example just alphanumeric numbers and letters. Okay, so I'll just click to finish renaming and I'll go back to the game start point now. Go to the properties. So if you want to use this MP start trigger, what you would do here is go to this command field and for each game start point that you add to the map, and remember that you need eight for your map. I'm only doing one just because this is a simple example map, but you really need eight. In this command field, what you would do is you type in msg for message, mp start, trigger. So spaces between msg, mp start, and trigger. And what that is, is that's a command message and the name of the object you're sending the command to, which is mp start, and the command itself or the parameter, which is trigger, which will trigger on the mp start object when the player spawns in this command gets sent and what you also want to make sure of is for this option here is send command on respawn make sure that it's set to true for every game start point that you add because if you don't change this to true the command will never be sent 
So every time a player spawns in, this command here gets sent, message mp start trigger, and this option here makes sure that it is sent when it's set to true. But as I said, we're not going to actually add an mp start object to our simple example map, so I'm just going to delete this command, set this back to false, go to the notes tab here, and then just click on mp start, highlight it, and delete the mp start object. Now before I forget, I just realized something. Going back to the world properties object, clicking on it, and then going to properties, if you go here to fog info and click on the button beside it, by default, dedit sets your map to have fog enabled. It's set to true, but we don't want that for our map because in the Tron world, you wouldn't expect to see fog in your map, so we're just going to turn it off. We'll set fog enabled to false, click OK, and now you won't have the fog effect anymore on your map. Unless you want fog, but again, since this is the Tron world that we're creating here in this light cycle map, we don't really want a fog effect. So now, with that out of the way, the next thing we're going to do is create a brush, a plane actually, another plane. Cl click, right click, add plane, then click OK. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn this into a speed zone because every light cycle map has speed zones and slow zones. So because of that, we want it in our light cycle map too, right? So, okay, we've created a brush for the zone. And now we're going to move over to the top view here, zoom out a little bit, and we're going to resize the brush. And in fact, I'm going to increase the grid size up to say 1024 again by hitting the plus key on the, num on the number pad zoom out actually let's zoom in a little bit again and now we're going to stretch the brush in each direction this way, this way this way, let's zoom out a bit and also let's zoom out by holding down the I key and moving back and up. Let's take a look. And that's quite a large speed zone, so that's good. So now we'll zoom out some more on the top view here by holding down the O key. And then we're going to drag the brush over this way towards the edge. And let's shrink the grid down back to, to 64 to the default and drag the brush some more over to the edge like this. Okay, now I'll hold down the I key and move over to this brush. And the next thing we're going to do is actually move the brush up because, I don't know, I, I think you can see it here indeed that if you look carefully, you'll see that this brush is actually in the same space as the floor right now. It's in exactly the same space. And as I move the camera view here, you can sort of see that part of the plane is visible and also part of the floor is visible, that, you know, they're sort of, you can see one and the other. And that's called clipping or Z-fighting. And if we don't move the brush out of the same space as the floor, you'll get the same thing in your map and it'll look terrible. So we don't want that. So what we're going to do so we're going to move here to the left view and let's zoom out a bit. And what we'll do is we'll shrink the grid down to 1. So I'll hit the minus key on the, on the numeric keypad and shrink it down to 1. And then we'll hit the up arrow key, which will move the brush up 1D edit unit. So that way it's not occupying the same space as the floor anymore and you won't get that clipping or Z-fighting as it's called. So now the brush will be okay. So now the next thing we want to do is we'll go over to the textures tab here and we want to apply a texture to this brush because right now it doesn't have one. So we'll go in here into text, prototype, prefab, MO2, and we'll scroll down here until we find this one here. 
MO2 switch panel 005. This is a nice green texture. So when you go over here, right click, go to texture, apply texture. Now we've got a nice green glowing texture on this brush so that when the, the player looks at this, it'll have a nice green glow, which is what you would expect from a light cycle speed zone. Now this brush, this plane, is just here for looks. It doesn't actually speed up the light cycle player, so we need to add something else to the map now. So what we'll do next is we'll go up here to this uh, button here called Marker to Selection and click on it. And what it'll do is it'll move the marker to the dead center, to the very center of this brush that we have selected this plane. So now the marker is right in the middle of this brush. And what we'll do is we'll add another brush by right-clicking, going to Add Box, click OK. And now we have a brush box right centered where the marker is. But that's no good because it's in the floor, so we have to move it out of the floor. So I'm going to go back down to the left view here and increase the grid back up to 64 by hitting the plus key on the numeric keypad. And then I'll move the, the brush box up. But actually now it's floating above the, the floor, which we don't want either. So I'm going to shrink the grid down one unit or one level. And then it's down to 32 grid units per square. So I'll move the box down one. And now it's flush with the floor. And I'll move the grid back up to 64 units per grid square. So now we've got a box sitting on top of the floor. And now what we do need to do next is resize this box so that it covers the entire plane, the entire brush. So we'll zoom in here on the top view and we'll stretch this box and make it the same size as the speed zone brush, the green plane. So I'll zoom out a bit and stretch. Stretch it over to that side. Now stretch it up, and then stretch the bottom. So now this brush covers the entire green plane that we've created. And one more thing you, you should do is if we go down to the left view here and zoom out a bit, what you should do is stretch the brush up so that it's 128D edit units tall. Just just so you can see it easier and also to make sure that when the player enters the brush it will cause the player to speed up. But actually this brush alone will not do the trick. It won't cause the player to speed up. In fact if a player tries to enter this brush he'll crash into it. It's a solid brush right now so we need to do something else. So what we'll do next is we'll hit the marker on selection button or marker to selection button to center the marker on this brush and right click, go to add object, scroll down, click on the plus beside volume brush and now we're going to select light cycle speed zone and click OK. So now we've created a light cycle speed zone object in the middle of this brush. Now we'll go to the nodes tab here and what we're going to do is take this brush, click on it, hold down the left mouse button and drag the brush on top of the light cycle speed zone object here in the nodes pane and let go and now what's happened is, is you've bound this brush to the light cycle speed zone object it's now a child node of the light cycle speed zone and it's inherited the properties of the light cycle speed zone so now if you go to properties here you'll see all these properties for this light cycle speed zone but to be honest, you don't need to change a thing. You can just leave it the way it is. And the same goes for the brush. You don't have to do anything special to the brush. Now that the uh, brush is bound to the light cycle speed zone, now the brush is no longer solid. And when the player drives with the light cycle over the green plane, over the brush that we created, this brush, this volume, will cause the light cycle player to speed up when he's over the green plane. So now that we have our fast zone, or speed zone, let's create another one. Let's create a slow zone. So what we'll do is, is we'll click twice on the light cycle speed zone so that we've highlighted both 
the parent object and the child object. We've got both of them highlighted now. And we're going to click this button here, the stamp button. And what it will do is it will create a copy of both objects. So now we've got another brush and another light cycle speed zone object. So let, let's rename the speed zone object for now to light cycle slow zone. Because that's what we're going to change it to in a moment. Right now it's still a, a speed zone object, but we're going to change that in a moment. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go over to the top view here, zoom out a bit, and we're going to drag our copied objects over to the other corner here. Let me move by holding down the I key. And we're going to put it right about here. So now we've got copies of the objects over here in the other corner. Let me go back to the camera view. Use O to rotate with the mouse and move over. And now as you can see, the copied objects actually are not exactly in the same spot as the original objects were. Right now the brush and the objects are sunk through the floor and we don't want that. So what we'll do is we'll go down to the uh, left view here and we'll just press the up arrow key. Actually let's move over so we can see it. There we go. And we're going to press the up arrow key and now the brush and the objects are flush with the floor which is what we want. Whoops, I, I forgot to copy the uh, the plane as well, so I better do that quick. So I'll click on the brush over here and hit the stamp button, which makes a copy. And now I'll drag it over to the brush and the object are. So I'll drag it over here. Now the plane is currently too high. It's up in the air, so I'll have to drop it down. So I'll shrink the grid here in the left view down to one de-edit unit per grid square. Zoom in and then drop the brush, the plane, so that it's just one unit above the floor and there we go. Uh, this, it would have been a lot easier if I just highlighted that plane along with the other objects when I clicked stamp so that way I would have copied all three but unfortunately I forgot so okay there it is now. So now what we're going to do is we need to retexture this plane because it's green at the moment and we want to change it to red because this is going to be a slow zone so we'll go to textures now we need to go to MO2, Courtney, bin MO2X, go to base, and here is a nice red texture that we can apply to this brush. So we click on this texture, go over to the viewport here, right click, go to texture, and click apply texture. And now the plane will be red instead of green for what's going to be a slow zone in a moment. So now we'll go back to the nodes pane here and we'll click on light cycle slow zone and now we're going to move down to this brush 2 here to the red check mark in the left square hold down the shift key and click on the check mark and now what we've done is we've deselected the brush so that now only the light cycle slow zone object is selected Next we'll click on the uh, Properties tab and then we're, we're going to click this Change button and what we can do then is change this object from one kind to another. So right now it's a speed zone. So we'll click on Slow Zone and click OK. And now this object has become a slow zone instead of a speed zone. And if we go back to the Nodes tab, now our brush is still bound to this object, to this slow zone, and instead of just being named slow zone, now it actually is a slow zone object. So now we've converted this into a slow zone and we're done with that. Probably the next thing we should do is rename our brushes and objects because they, they have generic names. Diet is giving them gen generic names, but 
it's coming to the point now that there's a number of them, and we, we're not sure which one is which. We can't tell them apart. So it's best now to start renaming these objects with sensible names so that we know what they are and don't get confused later. So, if, for example, this brush zero here is the floor, so I'm going to change it to floor. And this brush one here is the green plane for the speed zone, so I'm just going to change this to speed zone. Game start point, I'll just rename it to game start point one because it's the first one. It's there's only one game start point number one, but if you had eight of them, you would go you know one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I think it's just better to change it to game start point one. Light cycle slow zone. Well, I'm just gonna get rid of the zero because we've only got one light cycle slow zone on our map, so we can just leave it like this. And brush two. Well, we'll just call this slow zone brush, I guess. And then rename light cycle speed zone. Get rid of the zero. And change this brush to speed zone brush. World properties. There's only one world properties object in the map, so we'll get rid of the zero and just leave it at world properties. And then this brush here is slow zone. We'll name it slow zone. So now all the objects and brushes have been renamed to more sensible names so we know what they are and we won't get confused about what they are later as we add more objects to it. Now we're going to add a couple of light cycle power-ups to our map because every light cycle map has power-ups. So, okay, we've got the slow zone here which I'll highlight and then center the marker on it, okay, and then we'll right click, go to add, object, and we'll scroll down here until we find light cycle power up. So we'll click on that, click OK. So now we've got a light cycle power up object, but it's it's up in the air, suspended above the floor, so we'll need to move it down so it's flush with the floor. So let's zoom out here a bit in the left pane. And we've got grid one select, grid size one selected so that when we move the power up, it moves one unit at a time. And we want to make this flush, actually let's make it flush with the plane, the slow zone plane that we created. So this is close enough. So now it's, it's sitting right on top of our slow zone. So now we go to the properties of the light cycle power up and we want to change it to let's make it a missile so now it's a missile power up and the respawn time we'll change it to five seconds so it respawns pretty quickly so and that's it so now we have set this power up to a missile and I'm going to rename it right away to what it is so I'm going to change it to missile let's now click on our speed zone, click on marker to selection, zoom out, go over to our speed zone, right click, go to add, object, again scroll down until we find light cycle power up, click on it, click OK. Now we've added another light cycle power up. We'll zoom out in the left view here and we'll move over now and here's our power up zoom in a bit and again move it down until it's flush with the green plane that we created earlier so move it down zoom in a bit more and now it's flush with the green plane as well so we'll go to the properties and we'll leave this one as a shield we'll make it a shield change the respawn time to five seconds go back to the nodes pane and we'll rename this one to shield there we're done now we've got two light cycle power ups on our map on the speed zone and the slow zone now there's only a couple of things left to do we have to add a light so that we can see the map when we're in it in the game 
and we're going to have to add some walls in the sky so that we have something to look at in the distance. So let's highlight, select our floor brush, click marker to selection, zoom out, right click, go to add, object, and we'll scroll down until we reach light, click on light, click OK, and now we've got a light object in the middle of the floor. We'll move over there now. And as you can see, there's a light object here on the floor. We'll go down to the left view, increase the grid size back up to 64, zoom out, find our light, zoom in a bit, and then move up. And we'll move up a fair ways so that the light is quite high above the map. I'll zoom out a bit. And this will probably do fine. So let's go to the top view now and zoom out as well so we can see our whole map. And we'll go to the properties of the light and let's set fast light objects to false because fast lighting is a type of lighting that's cheaper to calculate but it doesn't look as good so let's set this to false we'll also set sh uh, we'll set to cast shadows to false as well now because we don't really want shadows in our map and now we need to increase the light radius to cover our entire map in fact what you might want to do is make the radius double the size of the map because as the light travels across the map it begins to drop off, fall off in brightness. That's called light attenuation. You could change the light attenuation preset but I'm just going to keep it simple. And I'm going to set the, the light radius big enough so that it's actually twice the size of our map so that the, the light attenuation, the light doesn't drop off once it reaches the edge of the map. It'll stay bright. So let's see, let's try 1200, nope that's not enough so we'll increase it more, we'll set it at say 6000, let's see what that gets us, let's zoom out a bit, mm, a little bit bigger, set it to 8000, that's pretty good. So that's about twice the diameter of our entire map. So that way the brightness won't fall off once you reach the edge. So that's good. So we'll just leave everything the way it is here, all these settings. We won't bother changing them for now. I'll get into more advanced lighting in a future tutorial. Like for example, I'll get into directional lights, stir lights that help to improve the lighting in your map so that everything looks better so the models are lit better and, and look bright instead of dark. But for now, I'm just going to keep it simple and just have one light in the map that lights the entire space. Another way you could light your map is to go to World, World Info, and type in Ambient Light 256, 256, 256. These are the RGB values, the red, green, and blue values of the light and if you set them all to 256 you'll get a white light but to be honest ambient lighting like this doing it this way is not a good way to light your map the lighting is flat and dull looking it doesn't look good so we'll just get rid of this actually and click OK because we don't want ambient lighting now that we've got a light the next thing we want to do is create some walls so we'll go back over here right click add box click OK so now we have a box brush here in the middle, but now we need to make it much larger. We need it to encompass the entire floor and the entire map. So we'll set the grid size up to, say, 1024. Zoom in a bit. Click on one of the handles and drag. And we're going to drag this way out to the edge of the floor. Zoom out again, zoom in, drag the next handle out, and the next one. And 
keep going, zoom out a bit actually. Okay, so now we're, now we've got the last side here. There we go. So now the box encompasses the entire floor of the map. So now let's go down to the left view here, zoom out a bit, and we'll stretch it down a bit so that it's not in the same space as the floor, the bottom of the box. Now it's below the floor. And we'll s zoom out again, and we'll stretch the box big enough so that it's just above the light, the top of the box. So now you've got this box that's surrounding your map that has or represents the walls of your map. Now what you need to do is right now the faces of the brush or box are facing outward and you don't want that. You want them to face inward. So what we'll do is we'll hit the F key and it flips the faces of the brush so that they face inward now. So now when we apply a texture to our what are going to be our walls, we can see the texture because otherwise the texture would be on the outside if the faces were facing outside. Now that the uh, faces are facing inward, when we apply the texture we can see it. So we'll go over to the textures tab and pick out a texture and I'll just pick some texture that's half decent <laughs> and scroll down here and keep going I'll pick this one and I'll go to texture, right click to texture, apply texture, and now we've applied the texture to our walls. Now the thing is, is we want to add a sky too, and we've got this box that totally encloses our map, so we won't be able to see the sky. The ceiling is blocking our view. So what we need to do is we'll go up here to this button here called Geometry Edit and click on it. And what that does is it allows us to move the vertexes of the brush around and also to work with the individual faces of the brush. So what we want to do is we want to get rid of this, this ceiling here. So what we'll do is, is with our mouse pointer on top of the, the top face of the brush, we'll hit the Page Down key and what this does is it deletes that face. So now we've got a brush box with its top missing. It's open. So now we'll be able to see the sky if we create one. With that done, there's one last thing we need to do and that's create the sky. So what we're going to do is we're going to create another <laughs> brush box. So go to Add Object Box. Click on it. Click OK. We've got another box now and we need to go back to brush edit mode so we'll click on that button so we're back in brush edit mode and zoom out and here in the front view I'm going to increase the grid size to say 1024 again zoom in a bit drag stretch this box so that it goes past the bottom of our wall box stretch it up stretch it out past side of the floor then do the same with the other side stretch it out past the other side of the floor and then we'll go to the top view here and again stretch it so that it's past both sides of the floor in this direction. Let's zoom out a bit. One more. Same for the other side. Stretch it out. Okay. So now we have a box that completely surrounds our floor and our walls. And this is going to be for our sky. So now we hit the F key again to flip the faces of this box. 
and what we do next, we go to the uh, properties tab here and we change the type of this brush to a sky portal. So that's it, that's all we needed to do for this brush. Now it's a sky portal, we don't need to change anything else. Now that the uh, faces are flipped inward, that's good. This is going to show us our sky in a moment after we add one more thing to the map. So this will show us the sky in the background. Now there are three ways that you can add a sky to a map. There's the way that's described in the documentation. You can just now, if you wanted, this box that I've created, you could apply a texture to it with a texture that would be suitable for a sky and you wouldn't have changed the type to sky portal, but that's not a very good looking sky. So what I'm going to do is use one of the skybox prefabs, as they're called, that were supplied as part of the tools from Buena Vista Games and Monolith. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the prefabs tab here, click the plus beside prefabs, and I'll click the plus beside MO1 here, go into the skybox folder. I'm going to double click on this sky prefab. When I do that, the prefab will be added to the map where the marker is. So now I've got this prefab in the map, but it's partially inside of our our map. So we need to move it outside. So I'm just going to go here to the front view and move it up. And now it's outside of our map completely. It's outside of that brush that we enclosed the map in to create a sky which will project this sky prefab that we just added. So we just need to make sure that the prefab is somewhere outside of the map where it can't be seen. So now that we've done that, let's go back to the nodes tab quickly and let's rename our brushes. This here is the walls, so we'll change this to walls. This is the, the sky portal, so we'll rename it to that, Sky Portal. Light, we'll just, since we only have one light, we'll just change it to light. And that's it. We'll leave this, the Sky Prefab as is. We're not going to touch that. And now I just realized that actually we're not done yet. There's a couple more things we still need to do. And for example, with the Sky, sky Portal brush here, I can't believe I forgot this. If you go to the properties of the Sky Portal brush, you need to make sure that detail is set to false. This is very important or else your map won't compile properly. What it is is that the outermost brush, which in, th in this case is this sky portal brush which will present us with our sky, this outermost brush needs to be set to detail false. It's very important and there can only be one detail false brush in the entire map. One and only one. This one. All the rest of the brushes need to be detail true. So now that this has been taken care of, now our map will compile properly and it'll be okay. And the other thing I forgot is that we need to add, a, we still need to add a spectator object. So let's highlight the game start point here and click marker to selection so we move the marker to where the game start point is and we'll move over to it in the camera view and we'll right click, go to add, object, scroll down until we find spectator object and click OK. And now right now this spectator object is sitting in the exact same spot as the game start point and we don't want that. So we're going to go down here to the left view and use the up arrow key to move it up a couple of grid squares and now it's not in the same spot anymore as the game start point. And for this object, we don't need to rotate it. We don't have to bother because for some reason the spectator, spectator object ignores which way you've rotated it. It always faces the same direction no matter what you do. So when a player spawns in, he's always facing one direction. Even if you try to change the rotation on this, it won't make a difference. So don't bother. So now that we've added the spectator object, what this means is that when a player first joins the map, but before they start playing, they'll appear at this point and they can move around and look at everybody else playing. They're hovering in the air before they actually start playing. 
and you need this object or else you won't have a point to, to watch the other players from. So now that we've added this object, let's just rename it quick and get rid of the zero. And that's that. And now that's it. Finally, we're done. Can you believe it after all this time? <laughs> So I guess we'd better save our map quick, you know, before DNA crashes or something. So let's go up to the file menu and choose Save World As. And we're going to change the file type to TVW, Trom Binary World. And the reason we're doing this is because in the future, when we load this map again, if we save it as a TVW file, it'll load faster. DEdit loads these TVW files faster than the other file formats, which are LTA and LTC. So let's save it as a TBW file, and now I'll save it, and wait, and now it's done. Now I've saved the map and we're safe. So the next thing we want to do is compile it. We need to compile the map before we can use it in the game. So we'll go up here to this button, Process World, and we'll click on it, and this this line here, this field project path, it's very important that this is set correctly as well. In my case, my game is at DTRON 2.0, and it's got the game folder added to the end of the path. In your case, it will probably be C program files, Point of Vista Interactive, Tron 2.0 game. So just make sure that this project path is set correctly, uh, because if you don't set it correctly, actually this is probably what causes when you run the map in your game, it causes the textures to be missing in your map. So just make sure that this project path is set correctly. Okay, now for the other options here, we'll just pretty much leave them at the defaults. Uncheck shadows and vertex lighting only. They're not necessary. If you're creating a, a map with a Tron look, these aren't necessary to, to process your map with. And the advanced tab, we're just going to leave that alone. We're not even going to bother changing any of that stuff. So now I'll click the process button and the map will be compiled. And now it's done. Our map has been compiled. So we click close. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take this compiled map file, which is a DAT file, D-A-T dot D-A-T, and we're going to move it somewhere where we can use it so that we can load it into the Tron game and test it out. Now, most DEdit users probably go up to the Run World button up here and use this to test their map, but I prefer not to use it for a couple of reasons. One is because after a while I find if you use DEdit, the Run World button will stop working. If you click on it, suddenly you'll get an error message popping up saying that it won't work, there's an error. So basically for that reason, I don't want to use this feature. And also because if you do use this, what will happen is, is your light cycle map will be loaded up into the game in single player mode. So what you'll end up doing is testing your light cycle map in single, play, single player mode. And it just it's not good for testing. You won't be able to drive a light cycle. Instead, you'll end up walking around on the floor. And it's just not a good way to test your map. Instead, what you want to do is go into the game, click multiplayer from the main menu, click host, and then go and scroll through the map list and add your test map to the, the maps in rotation and click play. And that way you'll be able to test your map properly and you'll be able to drive around in your light cycle and see how it is for other players. So we're going to do it that way. So let's move down to the um, worlds folder here and we're going to click, or sorry, we're going to highlight test and copy it and we're going to move up out of this directory and in my Tron 2.0 directory, I've created a folder called Custom. So we're going to go into that folder now. And in the Custom folder, I have another folder called Worlds that I've created. So I'm going to go into that folder now. And inside the Worlds folder, I've created another folder called Retail Light Cycle, one word, Retail Light Cycle. So I'll go into that folder now. And now I'll paste the map in here. And now that I've done that, what will happen is, is because it's in this folder structure inside your Tron 2.0 game directory, when you go to host uh, a game, a server, this will now appear as a map that you can select to host. And then when you go and, and host it and click play, 
you'll be able to test out your map the way you intended it to be as a light cycle map. So that's it. Now let's test out our map.